When I knew it best, just prior to the First World War, there was no part of the country to excel the Wirral Peninsula for short and fascinating railway runs. It holds an astonishing contrast in scenery for so small and compact an area, and although the distance across the peninsula is small, one could pack in a respectable mileage by train. It was a summer Saturday in 1913 when, as a student in Birkenhead, on a sudden inspiration I did an enjoyable circuit of the Wirral. Chosen as twelfth man for a cricket match at Birkenhead Park, I found I was not going to get a game, and wanderlust in conjunction with an unusually healthy pocket money situation made me decide to have a circular journey in three different trains. A short walk from the pavilion took me to Birkenhead Park Station, where one descended wooden stairs from the street. A Wirral train had just pulled in and its hot breathing little tank engine had unhooked and drawn forward under the road bridge in Booking Hall to run round and start off again, bunker first, to either New Brighton or West Kirby on the Mersey and D corner of the Wirral. Birkenhead Park was the terminus of both the Wirral steam trains and the Mersey Electrics from Liverpool via the Mersey Railway Tunnel. It was a Mersey Electric I took for the first and shortest leg of my jaunt, it was a train of three lofty American-looking cars with end doors and platforms. A toot on the whistle and we were off into the tunnel, coasting down a steep gradient, but only to Hamilton Square where I alighted, which was deep set well below the bottom of a very deep lift shaft. Going to street level was a slow and dignified process compared with the nippy electric lifts of later days. Less than ten minutes after leaving Park Station, I was hurrying down the sharp brow of roadway leading to the passenger entrance to Woodside Station, hardly noticing the lines of road traffic, mostly horse-drawn but with electric trams and some hissing steam wagons on their way to join the luggage boat of the Birkenhead Ferry to Liverpool. At Woodside Station, the main arrival platform, just inside the lofty twin-arched roof and largest of five platforms, the 240 to Paddington, incorporating through carriages to the west of England, was ready to leave with Great Western Engine Number 1 at the head, as far as Chester. The West Kirby branch train, for which I had taken a ticket, was standing at a middle platform, also with a Western tank at its head. Carriages were supplied by the other partner of the joint lines, the London and North Western. Their purple spilt milk livery looking cool in hot weather, but very arctic in winter. Our Saturday's only train was off. Once through the tunnel and past Grange Lane coaching sidings, there was little uphill work left. The panorama of Liverpool and the Mersey, with its shipping and docks, was perhaps more interesting than the congested townscape of industrial Tranmere on the other side. From a railway enthusiast's point of view, the sight of the Mersey electric trains climbing out of the tunnel at Green Lane to run alongside the main line was to be preferred. The first station, Rock Ferry, is still the terminus for Mersey Electrics, and there was always much activity with interchange passengers to and from Liverpool. After Rock Ferry, we were not due to stop again until Hooton, and the Metro tank would have a chance to show its paces along a very straight stretch of superb line. This four-track stretch of the Birkenhead and Chester was lavishly signalled, and spacious stations at Bebbington, Spittle, and Bromborough were typical of the approaches to London. No other company went to such extravagance to serve such tiny places. Even paving and platform coping were of a permanent classic perfection, and the track even in little used sidings was maintained like the chancel floor of any cathedral. The outer suburban residences then dotted along the open countryside were somewhat reminiscent of Tring or Hatch End, and the traveller could be excused for expecting to see little line-side board extolling somebody's liver pills and adding London, 21 miles.
my compartment was cosy, showing views of Hollyhead with ships plying from there to Ireland, and a notice requesting passengers not to throw out of the window any bottles or other objects which were likely to injure men working on the line. After our little tank had worked up well towards 50 miles an hour, a trill on the whistle betokened our arrival outside Hooton, where we were diverted first to the slow side and then again to the West Kirby branch platform. From Hooton the main line to Chester continued south, a branch followed the Mersey via Ellesmere Port to Helsby, whereas we turned westwards, then northwestwards towards the D coast. Leaving Houghton, warm from its sprint up the main line, the small branch train became its natural self, clattering with satisfaction over short rail lengths. Our first halt was at the small station of Hadlow Road, which served the village of Williston. But no scanning of the maps ever revealed a place called Hadlow. After the driver, station master and guard, with his prodigious silver watch, in hand had leisurely discussed the weather and the haymaking outlook, we were off again, and the track showed a falling tendency as it rounded the ridge, which is Wirral's backbone, to Neston, where an overbridge carried the much more juvenile Liverpool and North Wales line part of the Great Central System, where trains from Wrexham reached the Mersey at Seacombe. The coast was reached at Park Gate, and we pulled up within sight of small fishing craft which had survived the larger ships that once made Park Gate an important port on the route to Ireland. But the Dee lost its maritime commerce to Mersey, and the channels were allowed to silt up. We now travelled northwards, parallel to the coast, with frequent views across the Dee to the North Wales coast and hills, and an occasional plume of engine smoke showed the presence of a distant Hollyhead or Llandidno Express. Heswell served a fast-growing village. The gorse and heather on the hills to our right made it a great centre for day trips and afternoon picnics. One picnic party, who had been filling the front carriages of my train, probably a Sunday school trip, crowded the platform as we waited for a short goods train to bypass us on the station loop. The engine was number 656, a great western saddle tank, one of the regular carriage siding shunters at Birkenhead which, like me, could not resist a Saturday afternoon out of town. At Thurston, the next small station, the line came close to low cliffs leading down to the beach, but the shallow cuttings restricted our view to a lavish display of summer wild flowers which carpeted the embankment.
Onwards to Kaldi, the scenery was quite hilly and picturesque. And after a token stop at the tiny platform of Kirby Park, we were gently pulling up at West Kirby, our terminus, near the middle of a trim and prosperous little seaside resort. The line continued just a few more yards to give physical connection with the rival Whittle system, and I could see the black Whittle engine in the distance ready to leave with my next train. The Whittle station, situated a hundred yards away, was more commodious than the joint station. A three minutes walk and I was on the train. As I took my seat I could see the great western engine running round my last train to take it on its longer but faster return to Woodside. As we skirted the celebrated golf links by the next station, which was Hoylake, I realised how different this line was from the joint railway branch. It was double track all the way, but very inferior, being apparently laid on ashen cinders instead of clean ballast. The vibration and noise were much more noticeable, and although the short distances between stations ruled out speedy running, one got the impression of speed thanks to the short rail lengths and jerky riding for which the Whittle was notorious. After the sedate rural atmosphere via Hooton, the Whittle train seemed urgent and businesslike. After calling at several small stations, the great central line we saw crossing us at Neston came into sight, and we were breaking for Bidston, the main junction on the system. Across the island platform, the train for Wrexham was leaving. We were soon jogging over the points of one of the most complicated and interesting junctions in England, looking on the map like an hourglass. Beyond it was the main engine shed of the Wirral, adjacent to Birkenhead Dock Station, later renamed Birkenhead North. A brief run through brickwork and cinder bank cuttings brought us back at Birkenhead Park dead on schedule, with the Mersey Electric for Liverpool drawn up opposite. Resisting the temptation to start again, I was back at the cricket ground, ready to agree with the groundsman that it had been a poor match, but a lovely afternoon. <laughs>